Well, sitting uh, next to me uh, is uh, Dr. Robert Gould, uh, graduate of 1976, and uh, he was a chemistry major. And, uh, we're not going to hold it against him, <laughs> but uh, his uh, uh, journey to, to the business world uh, uh, has started a long time ago. And, uh, he will talk about his passion about the business, and I'm not a student funder, but uh, the way that we have been uh, uh, having this for the uh, user webinars uh, for we'll, uh, use a the interviewing format, so Q and A, now uh, ask some questions to the we'll have the speaker to um, give a response, and uh, we might. Uh, uh, build on the response and uh, ask some of the both more questions and then uh, also have a, uh, we also have a, an audience uh, online that uh, you can submit your question uh, to us and we're using the technology that is Zoom and uh, last year we used a uh, go to meeting and uh, this year we are switching to Zoom uh, it's the same kind of technology that uh, uh, we are able to host uh, webinars with uh, an audience. Uh, this uh, can be as far uh, as the other side of the wall or can be as close as well, just next door. In fact, uh, we invite some of our undergraduate students to be the participating as well. So the, without further ado, and I'm going to give you a quick uh, intro of our speaker, uh, Dr. Gould. And uh, uh, Dr. Gould had, uh, has a very successful career with uh, a pharmaceutical company that's called Merck. And I she was the Everyone knows of the company, yeah. uh, heard of the company, and might be the use their products too. Uh, but uh, after his uh, retirement, but, uh, instead of uh, taking on a life that's easy, <laughs> go golfing, fishing, or whatnot, uh, he has chosen to uh, help uh, found a company about six years ago that's called the uh, Happy Sign. And uh, he has grown so much over the years. And in fact, but, uh, uh, today, but, uh, Dr. Gu is the president and the CEO of Epizyme, and uh, which is a the company based out of the greater Boston area. Uh, Dr. Gu uh, completed his PhD at the University of uh, Iowa and did his postdoc at uh, uh, Johns Hopkins University and uh, is widely published with uh, 90 peer reviewed articles and also has 16 patents. Well, the, the reason why we are asking Dr. Gould to come uh, is twofold. One is what the, he is coming <laughs> to Spring Harbor already. He is uh, uh, one of the, the award recipients at the Alumni Banquet. And uh, I believe it was the, the Professional Excellence Award uh, that uh, Dr. Gould is receiving. But the more important than that is what the, his uh, uh, stories about the uh, Entrepreneurship, his entrepreneurship stories that, that he uh, can share with us, and also the leadership stories that I uh, really want to hear from him. So, the, maybe to start off, what the, uh, we'll the have Father Good share a little bit about his uh, journey to Spring Island College back then in 1973. Uh, he was a college, it wasn't a university per se. So, Father Good. Well, first of all, I'm going to begin by uh, Thanking you, Caleb, for this kind invitation and also uh, for the opportunity to revisit my uh, alum, alumni uh, roots after so many years. Uh, by way of background, I came, my, my parents were missionaries and they were missionaries with the Free Methodist Church. And so that really formed the seedling, if you will, of how I came to Spring Arbor. I wanted a, a, a quality Christian education uh, because my parents were missionaries with this, with the church we were familiar with Spring Harbor. I actually had an older sister who had who was in her third year of school here at Spring Harbor when I began to to apply to universities and colleges and I had another older sister who uh, was finishing her freshman year at um, Roberts Wesleyan College in New York but had decided to transfer to Spring Harbor uh, uh, next year and so like many choices in life, a key driver there was for me was family. I had sure. two sisters here, my parents knew the school, uh, it was a quality Christian education, and at the time I thought I might want to be a math major or at least a science major of some kind, and 
the quality of the uh, science education here was was already high. I knew it was high. I knew that, that uh, if I chose to go on to medical school, there was uh, a tremendous track record of people moving out of the sciences into medical school from Spring Arbor. And so all those components came together. And so in September of 1972, I began my journey here. Wonderful. Well, speak of the that, um, the track record of our science programs, especially in the BMAT area, um, uh, looking at the, the 2007 to 2012 uh, data, uh, all of our students would apply. The pre med students applied to the graduate medical school, and they uh, were committed. So oh, it's 100%. And, uh, yeah. It was high back then, it's right. still very high. And it's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are there any of the uh, professors that you still uh, remember uh, from almost four decades ago? Yeah, there are really four that impacted my life um, dramatically and significantly. And in fact, I, I had the tremendous pleasure of seeing one of them this morning, uh -huh. uh, Garnet Hubbard, who sure. taught, taught math, is still uh, uh -huh. uh, teaching yeah. math. She told me this morning, great pleasure of her life as she's been able to give up the administrative aspects <laughs> and continue teaching. But um, she had a profound influence on my life because she really. She really believed in me and my capabilities as a 16-year-old coming here to school, having somebody who says, you can do it, whatever it is, uh -huh. um, is just hugely uh, important. Um, in the chemistry, uh, in other three people are actually all in the sciences. One uh, was Dr. Gibbs, for whom the Gibbs Science uh -huh. Building is named after. He, he was my... Um, uh, direct faculty advisor that helped yes. me select the course work that I was going to do, uh, convinced me to switch from, uh, which was the right thing to do, switch from math to chemistry as a major, and then just showed such a tremendous love for his science and love for teaching and love for people that I began to realize that you could have a career in science that did not necessarily mean you had to cloister yourself away uh -huh. in the laboratory. The third one was the Dave Johnson, who was also a chemistry teacher, and what Dave taught me was just two things, how to integrate uh, his Christianity into daily life. He began every Monday morning general chemistry class with uh, scripture reading and prayer, which for a science, somebody coming out of a secular school uh -huh. in, science, yeah. but in science, that was unusual. And the fourth was uh, Lois Edwards, who taught me real love for biochemistry, which eventually mm -hmm. is how I ended up forming my career. Wow. So it's four people. I can't, couldn't name, sir. couldn't pick one of them out of the four. Well, the uh, Spring Arbor, the, uh, with God's grace, the still the, has been able to the, uh, impact students uh, on different disciplines, mm -hmm. in, uh, even the after uh, 40 years. <laughs> yeah, and, I uh, still remember like yeah. yesterday. That's right, that's right. Now, let's uh, switch gear a little bit then. Uh, you uh, uh, work at Merck for the, a good chunk of your career. And, uh, what is it like to work at uh, one of the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world? Yeah, it was, it was an experience that I wouldn't trade for anything else in uh -huh. the world because, again, of what it taught me and the opportunities it gave me. I entered Merck as what's called a bench scientist, so I was a scientist working in the laboratories at Merck. Merck was and still is one of the premier research institutes in the world uh, seeking to take scientific discoveries, particularly in biology and chemistry, and make medicines that, that yeah. help people. And um, people often used to tease me that if they cut me, I would bleed Merck Green because <laughs> I, I was uh, so committed to the enterprise of that company. And that enterprise of that company was really to bring value to yeah. patients and to have, take the sciences and the medicines and bring value to patients. There's a very old Merck quote from George Merck, who started, was one of the uh, children of the founders of the company, that said, um, medicines are for the people, and if we have, this is a slight paraphrase, medicines are for the people, and if we have never forgotten that, the prophets have never failed to follow. Um, mm -hmm. and, and what that actually taught me, and still taught me, is it's, it's so critically important to have the mission and purpose in life. And, without yes, it, and as a company, a company has to have a purpose in life to build the kind of loyalty and commitment that is necessary to do something which is actually extraordinarily difficult, which is to make safe and effective 
drugs for people. Uh -huh. um, and that, that is probably one of the most fundamental things I learned about work is the importance of passion and purpose and commitment to what you're spending your life doing. I, of course, learned tremendous technical things there, how to discover drugs, how to make drugs, how to, how to uh, develop them and commercialize them. Sure. And, the, and those lessons, of course, were irreplaceable. And that was a, is one of the premier companies mm -hmm. in the world. Yeah, yeah. Now, the, with your the academic background, but then, you know, some people say, well, well I'm going to retire. And uh, well, one of the things that I that have always wanted to do is to that might be to go back to the college, university to teach. Mm -hmm. Did it ever uh, cross, uh, come across your mind? It, it did. I actually enjoy uh, teaching. Uh, for example, I used to teach skiing because I enjoyed the yeah. aspects of, of teaching and I enjoyed skiing and I wanted other people to enjoy that passion. Yeah. When I retired, I, I, I did go to a research institute called the Broad Institute, which, which is a research institute uh, set up between Harvard and MIT. Uh, and the purpose of that research institute was to gain increased genetic understanding. But of course, there were a lot of students there mm -hmm. too. Over the so while I enjoy teaching, I realized over the twenty-three years or so that I had been at Merck that um, what I really enjoyed doing was discovering and making drugs. And it's important in life, as I said earlier, to do what you're passionate about. And that that was my passion. That's you right. can actually teach in that kind of environment because pe many people come into a company right out of school, right out of, of some other job, and you can mentor and teach them in that environment in a different way than you could in an academic institution, but in no less important way. And I, I enjoy doing that. Absolutely. Well, uh, you already mentioned that uh, well, you did the African time, but that uh, you did not stay there for very long, and then uh, you uh, <laughs> took a detour. I don't know if it was a detour, <laughs> but uh, how did it all come about uh, uh, being part of a the, uh, growing company, a biotech company, and still a young company? And, uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah. So I was I was at the Broad Research mm -hmm. Institute, and and what I thought I might be doing in my retirement was sitting on various boards and various, uh, be they board of directors or scientific advisors or, or other, other types of activities. Um, and one of the, I was approached to sit on the board of Epizyme uh, before it even was founded as a company. It was a venture-backed company. There were four original board members of Epizyme and I was one of the four as an independent board Sorry. member. And, uh, and so I became involved with the company at a very early stage. And I, as I learned more about the company, as I, as I began to think about the potential of that, of the, the, the scientific founding of the company, the people that were engaged in the company, even though it was when, I, when we got started, we were, the company was only three or four people, I became increasingly convinced that this was one of those rare moments in time when an opportunity presents itself in which my interest, my background, my experience, the scientific opportunity, the clinical and medical opportunity were always were all coming together in sort of one golden moment and I wanted to seize that moment. And so the other board members asked if I would become CEO and the other thing was in two thousand ten. It was in two thousand and ten. So two, about two years. The other thing I realized is that, that I wasn't ready to be I was I was still energetic, young, whatever you want to call it. I wanted to work, and I missed working. So, so. I remember, I remember going home when, the, when I was asked to be CEO. I remember driving home, wondering, boy, I wonder what my wife Sherry is going to think about this. We've been married for thirty-seven years, and so it's important to uh -huh. listen to what your wife has to say yeah, after yeah. those many years of marriage. And I, you know, so I sort of edged up on the conversation slowly, and, and she said. Why would you not do this? The ha you are so happy when you're going to do Epizyme work. Uh -huh. This is what you're supposed to do. So that, wow. made, it, that made it an easy decision. It was not as, a, as a romantic, I guess, or dramatic as your parents' uh, story. <laughs> <laughs> they would talk about uh, your parents, what uh, your dad and your mom, uh, they were engaged. Mm -hmm. But uh, each had uh, felt that's time for them to go to China, mm -hmm. and they were not uh, uh, in the same place, obviously. Right. Uh, so, the, well, 
the story is what the, your dad wrote a letter uh, to your to his fiance, indicating what the God is calling him to China, and he uh, didn't want to uh, keep uh, his fiance from the going to nursing, mm -hmm. so that he uh, well suggested that to break up the engagement. And the same day, he received a letter from the, your mom, <laughs> his fiance, saying, "Well, I felt God's calling, and I don't want to uh, keep you from the." Being an evangelist and then mm -hmm. involving evangelism in the world. And the suicide was the same thing. But yeah. God put this in both the parents' hearts. Yeah. Where she was, she was felt that God was calling her to be a nurse in China. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and yeah. so couldn't ask him to go to China. He couldn't ask her to go to China. That's right. And their right. letters crossed yeah. in the mail. So and my yeah. story is not nearly as romantic. It's not nearly as romantic. But, but it is romantic God. that I met yeah. my wife yeah. here at Spring Oh, that's great. Right. <laughs> that's great. Right. And uh, well, it's important that to the, to listen to your spouse, your wife, particularly. And in that case, what the, your, your spouse, what the your wife is very supportive of mm -hmm. your the venture. Mm -hmm. um, well, you touch a little, little bit on the well, you you find joy, you find happiness for the mm -hmm. uh, going to work. It's not work. <laughs> it's not. It's work. just what they're going in and they're able to do what you have always wanted to do. That's right. Um, Let's touch on a little bit on the, uh, the people aspect mm -hmm. of that. As a the scientist, a research scientist, what that might be, the, uh, your role uh, in the past is what that, okay, well, I do my job well and uh, I am satisfied. Mm -hmm. But uh, working the, or providing leadership in a the, uh, company uh, like uh, uh, Edison, you know, the are scientists who report to you. You have uh, uh, some of the exact team uh, working alongside with you. Uh, what is it like to, to provide leadership to the uh, company like Everson? Do you do you get joy and happiness from doing that too? I I do, and I think part of it is because um, I've have chosen to surround myself with people who share the the a common passion that I have for making medicines. For patients, and particularly make, in our case, we're making uh, uh, personalized therapeutics for patients with genetically defined cancers. So, seeking out, uh, seeking to leverage the understanding of the cancer genome to make very specific drugs to treat patients with very specific genetic changes for whom they have no other choices or options. And that that is a, a hard task. It's a rewarding task. It, it's a long task and it just takes people who are passionate about doing that to persevere through the ups, the downs. Um, so that's that's one aspect of, of the leadership that, that I actually enjoy is, is, is telling people, you know, and looking for and building the passion and for what our, our particular mission is. We're an 84 person company. We have a job to do and we're going to do it as best as we possibly can because people need us to do it as best as we can. The other aspect uh, is is uh, providing the kind of focus that enables us to has enabled us to be successful. We we have um, we've taken a very particular singular focus, a focus on something that we think it, we have a competitive advantage over other people. And at our leadership team meetings or other meetings, um, even earlier this week, we had a, a business opportunity that came up that on the surface looked very appealing to us, and as we as we talked through the opportunity as a team, we realized that if we did that, we were going to lose focus on what our core strengths were, what our core capabilities were. It wasn't a bad, it would not have been an intrinsically bad decision, but we realized that it caused diffusion of effort. Then it became very clear to us that for us, this was not the right thing to do, even though, even though on, at initial blush, it felt very attractive. So maintaining that focus and passion is really fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you like to be the uh, the CEO of the um, and you mentioned to the, the um, undergraduate audience that the, uh, well not too long ago you the spent two weeks on the road show the raising the capital mm -hmm. uh, for the company and that. Do you enjoy that part <laughs> of telling stories about the, the young company? And the passion. Yeah, I I do, and I I enjoy it 
so I'm an extreme introvert, so I don't enjoy it in the moment. I have to be honest. Um, what I do enjoy about it is is not only the opportunity to tell the story, but the opportunity to transmit some of what we're trying to do as a company to investors and to gain their trust that if they choose to invest in our company, two th two or three things will happen. We'll be enabled to to make patient make drugs for patients that need it. They'll be able to make a return on that investment, and overall, the world will benefit from that. You know, sin came into the world and created an environment in which disease now takes the toll on humanity in many different ways, both physically but also emotionally. And as a science major, one thing I can do, and I can use investors' money uh, appropriately to build the company so we can help address the consequence of sin in the world, which is disease. And so for me, that's just such a unique opportunity. Now, for investors, of course, uh, it's a return on investment, and I very much am focused on building value for them, but we can build value in multiple ways that are not exclusive. We can build monetary value, we can build social value, we can build value to human beings who otherwise would have no choice. Mm -hmm. And that's what I enjoy about it, is sure. the consequences of telling the story, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. or the, the results of telling the story. Mm -hmm. Well, in the business world, uh, we uh, often the measure success as what the, how much money the company's making, or the or personal success, what the, how many the, say titles you have, the, you have uh, after the name, the company. The, how do you define personal success, and uh, also the uh, in your own evaluation, the, are you successful? Hmm. So that that's an interesting. It's a loaded question. It's a very <laughs> loaded question. Um, so for, for person, defining personal su success for me would fall into two categories. One is, one is a family, um, and so I'm, I'm actually, uh, so proud's the wrong choice of words, but I, I have two boys who are committed to Christ, who are following their careers and doing everything they can to exercise their careers. One is a patent attorney the other as a uh, mountain guide to um, extol um, their love for God. And I am, I, am, I am proud of them, and I view that uh, as part of the success of the marriage I've now enjoyed for 37 years. And that I met my wife, George Bernardo, and that's just been, she's been my partner through many, many journeys together. And I, so I view that as a credit to her more than me. Uh, and credit to God to stabilize our marriage. The other part of, of sort of personal success is is I deeply believe in in a verse that I I uh, took us on um, uh, years ago, which uh, is that uh, while we've been saved by grace, God saved us to do good works that He created for us to do before the beginning of time, even before we even knew Him. And for me, those good. And for me, clarifying what those good works and realizing that for me, those good works are the opportunity to make life-saving drugs makes me feel that I'm actually have the potential to be successful because I'm doing what God created me to do. And that's going to be different for different people. But for me, that's that's what God, those are the good works God created for me to do before time. And I've been lucky enough to be involved with, with multiple products that are now on the market and sold and have saved people's lives. And so whether I'm successful or not, I feel like I'm living up to what God wants to do. And that, I guess, is my definition of success. Yeah. I hope we're not getting off on a tangent, but I want to go back to the, um, what you just shared earlier about the success you started with family. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you've been married with your wife for 37 years, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been married for 21 years. And, uh, there were ups and downs, and the, but the, what would be your advice to those with the might be the um, like Ryan who's not married but yeah. is dating. There are also someone in audience that would be married uh, for a few years or not. That what would you say is the, the your know, secret in the keeping uh, your marriage uh, going yeah. strong uh, daily? Yeah. I, for us, at least, for Sherry and me, it's 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 complete transparency and honesty. So we we share things 
daily with each other. We don't, if something arises as an issue, we don't let it linger for, you know, days and weeks and then have it explode in you know, some way that's not Good advice. healthy. We, we share things as they come up and try and deal with them as they are small problems before they become big problems. And, and a lot of that, this is, this is probably sound funny to some people, but part of that is just trust in each other. And, and that trust and transparency for us shows up in, in uh, some odd ways anymore, which is we still share our same email account. Now, we, we each have our own Gmail account, um, but we have full access to each other's Gmail sure. accounts, our email accounts. We share the same single checking account. We've never okay. had separate money. It's our money together. It's, it's our career together. She's sacrificed a lot for me to enable to build our career. So we're very much partners in every sense of the word. In fact, the other day she asked me, if she got updated her new iOS 8 on her iPhone. She was getting texts that were sent to me on her iPhone because we shared the same iCloud account. She, she actually said, can I stop getting your texts, please? <laughs> Not because there was anything in them, but she just didn't want to, didn't want to see my texts. <laughs> Well, then you've been very humble in the uh, Rob the, about your successes for that. Uh, I know the successes don't uh, don't just fall on a lap uh, randomly, and uh, many successful successful people that have uh, habits and uh, can share with us some of your habits. And uh, what do you do with Tinny uh, every day, every week, every month, every year? Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think um, sort of in a, in a in a global way, one thing that, that has served Death Design well uh, and, and served me well as I've moved through my life is, I, is I, I often ask myself, where do I want to be in three years and what do I want to look like, be, have accomplished in sort of that three year horizon. And the reason why that's important for me is because it means I don't sort of uh, jerk from day to day making random decisions on an hourly basis. I've got, I've got a goal in mind that I'm headed towards. And that, that goal might be, um, uh, I still want to be halfway married in three years, just to go off. Absolutely. So what that means is I'm going to behave appropriately today that, that preserves that. Um, I, wanted, I want to have Epizyme grow and be a successful company in three years. So what does that mean that I have to do today? So taking a long-term view enables me to then, then um, exercise a discipline um, in which I can say what are the, that's what I want to have happen in three years, what are the three things that I need to get done this year to get there in three years, and what are the three things I need to get done this month and this day, and what are the three things that I could do today, I should do today, but what are the three that I must do today that gets me towards that long term goal objective. And so sometimes taking a three year objective can strike people as a fantasy, but if you have that fantasy and then you're disciplined about breaking it down into manageable chunks, then you can get up in the morning and say the three things that I must do today are, and if I get them done, then there's three that I should do that I can get done. So it's it's that. So I start every I start I actually start every day with a couple of different disciplines. I mean, um, on my iPad, I have a Bible memory verse, so I'm working my way through all the Navigator Bible memory verses, which you know, I'm almost 60, so it's you know, keeping your mind shut. So yeah, I do yeah. that. Um, I, I uh, have a, also on my iPad, I have a prayer journal. I pray through for my wife and my employees. I actually pray for all my employees in the company. Um, not always. Rare if I mean, frankly, but before, but as groups, sure. I pray for the patients that are getting our drugs, that, yes. that, you know, yeah. that God's grace would shine on them through the activities that I'm doing. Yeah. Um, and I do that every day. Great, great. Yeah. Uh, Robert, we have uh, uh, one of uh, the participants for the raising this question that mm -hmm. I'm going to do. This what I tried to uh, read it uh, to you and uh, see if you can uh, help answer that. Uh, First of all, the, uh, uh, the participants that want to thank you uh, for sharing your story and uh, with us on this platform. And uh, the question just asks is, what, how competitive is uh, your industry? Mm -hmm. 
it's going to be very competitive. Yeah. <laughs> and what strategy has uh, Epicide uh, deployed over time to stay relevant and be at the, the cutting edge? Mm -hmm. So, um, the biotech world is, is uh, highly competitive. Um, and it's competitive in, in a number of uh, different ways. It can, depending on how you count it up, and in, if you include all, all the failures, because there's a lot of failures in drug discovery, it can be as much as uh, between one and, and, and six billion dollars to develop a drug, because you have to pay for your failures as well as your successes. Right? So it's competitive for dollars, for funding. It's competitive also because um, uh, we have a, a, an obligation um, and a commitment to create value for our shareholders, which means uh, for us that we need to generate revenue, which means we need to have drugs that have meaningful, um, uh, significant medical advances in the patients. And so it's competitive in that regard um, in order to appropriately design uh, and uh, clinical trials that show value. Uh, early on in Epizyme's uh, history, we, we decided to invest in uh, being a company um, and become a company that was heavily invested in, uh, in what at the time was, uh, we believed is a disruptive technology to take advantage of discoveries being made in the genomic world to make medicines for poor people. And that, that for us is, is a competitive advantage we still retain, that is we are invested in, in a disruptive te technology or creative technology, um, and we continue to actually be uh, among the world's leaders in the particular niche that we've created in Cardo for ourselves, and we continue to invest in that. So we're, we are have to be competitive on dollars, on our strategy, and then on our technology, and we do that um, frankly by hiring good people who believe in us and by focus, something I mentioned earlier. Sure. If we got out of focus, we would not be able to maintain our competitive edge that we believe we feel. And if we hired the wrong people, we would not be able to uh, maintain our competitive edge. Sure. And, and that's how we try and stay competitive. Yeah. When you mentioned that uh, the companies are public trade, that they can sell, uh, basically everybody can uh, invest in the company mm -hmm. if they choose to. That's right. And I think it's uh, traded with the NASDAQ, mm -hmm. EPZM. That's right, EPZM. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, we are running out of time. I don't know about anybody in the audience or wants to uh, raise another question, uh, but uh, I want to go back to the maybe <laughs> that's somewhat loaded question. <laughs> you came here in 1972 uh, as a 16-year-old, uh, probably had some dreams of, uh, okay, well, maybe either be a mathematician, uh, or going to pre med or what have you, the guide that you to a, the, a different direction. And uh, looking back almost 40, year, 40 plus years ago, that uh, that has been a good journey. It's been a wonderful yeah. journey. Yeah. And uh, the, the, if you look at the education as an investment, of the, well, whether it's your money, your money, or the, your parents' money, and the, how would you the raise your investment on uh, uh, the screen art education? Well, that's an interesting <laughs> question. So, so um, if I if I remember correctly, and I may not remember correctly, I would in and if I use twenty thirteen dollars, it, it was about eleven thousand dollars a year in twenty thirteen dollars when uh -huh. I came to, to screen sure. art. So let's call it a fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollar investment over the four years yeah. that I was here in twenty thirteen. Um, if I take that $50,000 and, and make a, a huge number of assumptions, not, not so much, I didn't look at it as an ROI, but if I look at the compound annual growth rate of that $50,000, it's on the order of about 20%. The S&P over that time period has been about 6% compound mm -hmm. annual growth rate. So my Spring Arbor mm -hmm. education has enabled me to have about a 4x to the S&P 500 compound <laughs> one annual growth rate, and that's one way to look at it. Beyond that, however, it's sure, monetary sure. value, however, yeah. is the value of just just uh, meeting my wife here, uh -huh. starting on a career that's been just so wonderfully yeah. rewarding, you know, having the opportunity to take things I learned here and apply them even 30 years yeah. later. If President Ellis is in the room, he will say that to you that 
Well, thank you, Robert. Check this in the mail <laughs> <laughs> for the being a uh, uh, spokesperson in the speak up on your experience. In the, I know what you're not exactly in, in the many of our students, what the uh, alumni of the what the uh, probably said the same thing. What the, the investment is uh, invaluable. Mm -hmm. and yes, what you did. You have some sacrifices, mm -hmm. but then uh, it pays off. And uh, what's important is, at Spring Harbor University, we don't just uh, prepare students for a job or even a career. We want the, you to be the client in the class, calling in your life, mm -hmm. and we want you to come and uh, experience the transformation that God has in store for everyone. And uh, with that, for the we uh, want to continue on uh, with our mission at Spring Harbor University. And, uh, I know the hundred students were there when you came here. Mm -hmm. but, uh, today we have over forty thousand, not forty, <laughs> over four thousand students, but then yeah. both on campus, off campus, and also online. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we just had the privilege of attending chapel, and and uh, I think you could have fit the entire student body in one section of Absolutely. the chapel when, Absolutely. when Jerry and I were here. And mm -hmm. It was just so good to see. It. Yeah. When I came from in 1993, I believe uh, we had about uh, 800 mm -hmm. students. Um, today, the campus population is uh, 1,600, mm -hmm. so it's doubled. And uh, God is doing great things, uh, uh, not for us, but uh, not for our glory, but uh, for His first glory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have great. any final remarks to share, it, uh, uh, Robert? No. I, well, I think um, I think importantly. It's, it's really, I'd leave the audience and, and uh, other people with sort of two comments. If, if you're really interested in building a company, it's really important that you ensure that that company is aligned with God's purpose for your life and you're completely focused on, on that because if we're not aligned with God's purpose for our life, but we might build a successful company, it won't have the totality of value in life without accomplishing God's and doing the good deeds that God created for us to do uh, with bringing a person's life. And that's probably the most important thing. Building a company that makes drugs for patients with genetically defined cancers is important as well. And that comes from that focus on the purpose of what we're doing to do. Sir, sir. And even that you're, uh, even you're not in, in a position to this, say that, um, to your investors for that while well, we are a Christian company. Well, you are not a Christian company. Mm -hmm. uh, it's one time that uh, a CEO was a Christian mm -hmm. and was not, was not shy about the, uh, adhering to the Christian principles. Mm -hmm. That's and, right. Uh, which is very important. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Appreciate your thank time. You. And, uh, thank you. The, you have been a wonderful audience and uh, will the post uh, the recording online and uh, to our uh, YouTube uh, as a new channel and uh, we'll uh, keep going with our uh, uh, webinar series and uh, we hope that you have been uh, uh, you have enjoyed today's webinar series. Uh, bye bye.